But the truth of who you are really cannot be remembered because it's here. It's not an object in your mind. It's who you are. It's the subject. Everything you think about yourself or even remember about yourself, even the most beautiful moments, are still objects <laughs> in your mind. And secondly, maybe just as important, I don't consider myself an Advaita teacher. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I how know about that? That, uh, <laughs> that I get put there because of Ramana Maharshi, right. who was my guru's guru. But even Ramana just finally acquiesced to that. People said, oh, what you're saying is Advaita. Oh, okay. He was a 16-year-old boy who actually questioned death. Mm. And in that true inquiry into death and what is it that dies and what remains he waked up. And so he wasn't practicing Advaita when he waked up. He was not in an Advaita household. He, he was a Hindu, and mm. they had the, the regular Hindu practice, but he wasn't even particularly religious. He was into sports and being a 16-year-old. Yeah. But his father died, and it shook him. And it, his family was in really bad straits. His, the source of livelihood had just died, and this is India, and so people live, have always lived pretty close to, the, to starvation and poverty. And so it was a huge shock on many levels. And he had to, just as an intelligent 16-year-old boy, just turn and, and really meet death, and actually meet it for himself what will die when I die, and, and he did that, and this is what most people avoid, of course, yeah. meeting death, yeah, because we may know or remember that we will die, but to actually be willing to meet death is, has been quite rare. But in his meeting and in his example for us of the possibility of meeting, he waked up, and he was silent for 11 years after that. He went to Arunachala, this holy mountain where he was just called. He, he called Arunachala his guru. It's a mountain in southern India, mm. Tiruvannamalai. And he couldn't speak, and not because he thought he shouldn't speak, or it was a vow of silence. It was just, he was, as he described it later, he was just absorbed in this wonder and this bliss of being. And in the recognition of what comes and goes, our bodies, our experiences, our thoughts, and what remains, that's life, or truth, and not our personal life, but life itself. So finally he did start speaking mm -hmm. after 11 years, and he attracted people, and, and that's when the, the different pundits said, oh, this is it, fighter, and he said, Okay. Whatever you say. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> because Advaita does speak about non-duality. If I were going to call what I'm offering people anything, I would say it's a non-dual teaching. Okay. Meaning that there's a recognition of the appearance of duality, me and you, and right. happiness and sadness. But if we follow that back, to its core, its beginning, we find it's the same, mm. same self, same energy, same being. As in Sanskrit, it's Satchitananda, mm. which is beingness awakened to itself and overflowing in the wonder or the love or the bliss. Yeah. Is that what some people call the witness? Would you call that? I wouldn't exactly call it the witness. Okay. The witness is a little dry for this. Okay. <laughs> I, I, witnessing is very useful yeah. because we detach from our, our thinking minds and right. just impulsively following right. or reacting to triggers. So that's useful, but it's, the witness is still an object in your mind. Mm. So the classic advisor question to that would be, who's witnessing? Right, and then that throws you even deeper into this inclusion of the that the witness and what is witnessed is is the same and inseparable from the awareness that holds them both. Mm. 